thank you everybody for, for coming and uh, thanks for the Carter Center for having me. This is a pretty magnificent space. I'd never been here before and it is, uh, if nothing else, humbling. Uh, and uh, also, thank you, Frank, Acapella Books. Uh, I felt like it, um, this was gonna be one of the places that was the more intimidating to come see in, in, in Hank's hometown or his uh, adopted hometown. One of the things that happens when you work on a project is that most people kind of wanna know why. Why do you do what you do and why do you gravitate toward certain subjects? And I kind of felt like this one was a natural for me, especially considering after the second book that I had done, which was about the steroid era, it was called Juicing the Game, Drugs, Power, and the Fight for the Soul of Major League Baseball. I kind of felt like when we had gotten done, when I'd finished that book, I was wondering if there was anybody else that I was even interested in writing about, because I felt like we had lost so much as a, as a culture and as a, as a society. I think in 2005, there had been so much, whether we were talking about the housing crisis, whether we were talking about steroids in baseball or performance enhancing drugs in cycling or any other sport, there just seemed to be a feeling, to me at least, that, that we had really lost a fair amount of this discussion of values. And I'd kind of felt that something disturbing was taking place when you talked about values, that the, the conversation about integrity and accountability and honor and all of these different words that we say are important to us, how much are we really practicing them? And I also felt when I talked to the ballplayers, there were so many players who in their own way had justified their own steroid use or justified their own actions simply by saying, well, you would have done the same thing for $10 million. And because of that, it's kind of a hard thing to argue, but at the same time, a year later, two years later, when you see the amount of damage that has been done, then now the players want their reputations back. And now they're finding out that it's a little bit more difficult to, to do that or to have your reputation after it's already been lost. And so for me, I kind of felt that when I started to think about what the next project would be, what, really, what was I really interested in, I was always still interested in baseball and I felt that there was a natural progression from that book to this one. And during a lot of the arguments that I'd had with baseball, commissioner with Bud Selig, we'd gone back and forth about the record book and we'd gone back and forth about this conversation that we were having about this argument on the one hand between the loss of integrity and the loss of faith that people were having in the sport and then Bud's argument that how can you say anything's wrong when we're making more money than we've ever made before? <laughs> and so I was thinking that there's, this, there's a space in between here. And I started to think that to me, Henry Aaron really did exemplify what was lost, what we thought about the sport, and just how many people as time went on, as we heard about the next guy who tested positive and the next guy who was on the list, how with every conversation it came back to the same thing. Well, what does Henry think? And what does Henry Aaron think about this? And of course he would be reticent to talk about it. And I started to think that there was an opportunity there to at least try to rediscover this man, even though that seems to be a strange word for somebody who's done as much as he's done. Did he really require rediscovery? And so the project took place, uh, I think around, I don't remember, it was February or March of 2006 when I first started to work on it and started to wonder if there was an opportunity to do this project. And what ended up happening was, I guess the kindest way to say it is, is that Henry Aaron didn't want anything to do with it. He had no interest in the project, and in fact, it took about, it took two years for him to even speak to me. And I understood it, and I mean, I didn't get it from him because his, his inner circle barely, very rarely even let him speak about, uh, about some of these issues because he didn't want to. There was too much that had happened. Barry Bonds was about to break the record, and he didn't want to get caught in the middle of a situation that really wasn't of his doing. And so, 
I decided to go to take a real leap of faith, which was to go forward on a project without necessarily having his input. And I figured I would roll the dice on it and see how it went and hope that during this period of working on the book that he would be interested in at least hearing me out. And his attitude, or at least the attitude of, uh, of his people had been that talk to him after, after Barry Bonds broke the record and then maybe we can have a conversation. Um, but that was fine. I, I really didn't believe that there was anything inappropriate about it. It's, it's, it was his life and I felt like, I mean, I remember telling him when we finally started talking, I fully expect you to hate this book. And he kind of looked at me and, and said, well, when, why would you think that? And, and I had said, well, because I would hate a book if somebody was writing it about me. I mean, even if someone, even if you talk to the closest people to me, maybe those people would emphasize something that I didn't think was very important or they may de-emphasize something that I thought was really important. It must be very, very difficult to be a national icon and have people write about you and interpret things for you. And so I had, uh, I tried to have, be as respectful as, as possible and tried to make it as representative as I, as I could. And, and one of the things that I found, and, and thanks to uh, his attorney, Alan Tannenbaum, we had gone back and forth for over a year about whether or not Henry would participate. And finally, it began to thaw a little bit. And I went to go see, I went to go see uh, Henry at this bizarre, bizarre uh, event. In, in New York in 2008, I believe. And it's one of the sections that I'm gonna read. He went to a, an autograph signing at this ice cream place in New York, which is actually a memorabilia shop as well. So it's really, really weird. You would go in there and you could buy like a milkshake and like a $300 Derek Jeter jersey. <laughs> so it was a pretty strange uh, uh, example in concept marketing. but. Uh, I remember it well because I felt that it was one of the first times when you work on a project and it was, it was one of the things that I felt was really important to me was how quickly was I going to be able to find something from Henry Aaron that was going to allow me to understand him. And, and I think this was my first biography as well so it was very, very difficult to try to, under, to find out, okay, what do you need to do a good biography? Well, you need to understand your subject. And this is not an easy subject. And so this opportunity when I went to meet uh, he and Alan up in uh, Manhattan was a first opportunity to try to get a glimpse, to step back and kind of see how the public dealt with him and how he dealt with it and, and just kind of what was happening. And so we talked for a little while before the event, and you could see that people were lining up. In fact, the line was going around the, around the corner to, to see him. And it was a really interesting thing to watch because what I thought was really strange about it was this balance between Hank Aaron, the public person, and Henry Aaron, the man. And so, one thing that I thought was even more interesting, too, was how much people wanted to, uh, what's the best way to say it? They really wanted to make eye contact with him, to let them know how much they cared about him, because there was so much surrounding baseball and surrounding steroids and everything else that, that it seemed as though people really wanted to try to connect with him, and it was, it was quite, a, quite a scene. So I say that, um, The adorning of him as the people's champion, and people would walk up to him and say, you know, you're still the home run king, Hank, did not evoke a response. He didn't respond to the dozen offhanded variations of the same theme, the Barry Bonds question. It was the public's way to broach the unspeakable, and by his total lack of reaction, you'd have thought the numbers that used to define him, 714, 715, and finally 755, as well as the names of Mays, Ruth, and Bonds, were by now just street noise to him. The names and iconic statistics are, of course, much more than that, and the oceanic space between the public Hank, who avoids confrontation, and the private Henry, who is clear and passionate and committed, explain why he can never do enough or say enough to satisfy 
supporters thirsty not only for his statesmanship, but his fire. Bonds was where the collision between Hank and Henry was often the fiercest, where the facade came closest to dissolution. It was Hank, the public man, the legend, who wished very well in his quest to break the all-time home run record, who avoided controversy. It was Hank Aaron who publicly drove down the avenue of gracious cliché. Records were made to be broken, he would say. He had enjoyed his time as the record holder, and now it was time for someone else to take over. And, and I say that was a cliché because it is, but he actually believed that, and he does believe in that, that the record belonged to somebody else. The distance, though, I think was best described by the sociologist Harry Edwards, who would talk about how because of where we're at in this time in, in baseball, that there's this gap between the record holder and the standard bearer, and that Henry Aaron is the standard bearer, and that the record belongs to Bonds, but it's just a number now. That if you really care about the sport, and if you care about where uh, we've been in terms of how Henry Aaron broke the record, he's still the standard. Aaron would be called bitter, an assessment that hurt him deeply. Henry would often say that he wanted people to know him, yet he was convinced that all the public wanted to know about was Hank. Quote, people don't care about me. They don't care about the things that made me into the person I am, he told me one wintry day in 2008. They don't care that I raised five children and tried to help people do whatever they can do to get their most out of their lives to allow them to chase their dreams. All they care about is that I hit 755 home runs or what I hit on a 3-2 pitch. There's so much more to me than that. The space between Hank and Henry wasn't supposed to be such difficult terrain. He was supposed to be like Reggie or Ruth or Ted Williams or John Wayne, where the person and the legend meshed, meshed so seamlessly that the individual became the myth. And whatever gulfs did exist, Henry believed most people felt that it just wasn't their problem. The fans didn't care that what drove him was not the unremarkable desire simply to be left alone sometimes. Many superstars before and after him were uncomfortable with the demands of fame. But the wish to use the enormous advantage of his talent, first to avenge the devastating limitations racism placed on gen previous generations of Aaron men, and second, like Jackie Robinson, to be complete, to develop an important voice on important subjects beyond the dugout. Henry believed the fans had no interest in these concepts, in his moral indignation. They just wanted Hank. He was on their baseball card. He was supposed to make them happy. And for all, the, for all his gifts on the baseball field, Henry Aaron did lack the oratory skills and unrestrained charisma. He hated public speaking to bridge the gap between Henry's smoldering drive and Hank's reticent celebrity. Roxanne Spillett, a friend and philanthropic partner of Henry said, quote, when I think of Henry Aaron, I see an introvert in an extrovert's role. Anyone who's ever been put in that position knows just how truly difficult it is, end quote. To the memorabilia collectors, Henry was nothing but a commodity. They were the ones who pushed the bats in the, in the man's large hands. Their, cold, their eyes were cold marbles, devoid of nostalgia or awe. They were the ones who demanded specifics. Quote, this one, and I remember this specifically, it was, I was just staring at, and, and, and Henry just started signing the bats. He didn't care, but I was watching it. I just thought it was crazy. He said, you know, this one has to say 715th home run, not 715 home runs. You could tell that they were collectors. The ones in line who weren't, however, who waited in the heat to trudge an inch closer to him, they were the ones who told him stories, or at least tried, because the line had to keep moving, about what Hank Aaron truly meant to them, then and now. He was their happiness before and in a baseball universe ethically complicated and corrupted by drugs <laughs> and money, the person they look to for their conscience today. Quote, I just want you to know that you're the real home run champion, end quote. It was Hank whom the public came to see, and each day, I'm sorry, and each and every one of them, in their shorts and tank tops and Yankees and Mets caps, stared into the lines of the old man's face, hoping, in fact begging, to make eye contact, so that when their turn to have their picture signed, 
I'm sorry, I just lost my trolling. Uh, so when it came their turn to have their picture signed of Hank breaking the record or a souvenir baseball or their tattered copy of his face on the cover of the New York Daily News, April 9th, 1974, quote, Mr. Aaron, I just wanted you to know that I've been saving this newspaper for 34 years just to meet you. This is my pleasure. When that moment finally came, they would find just the right words with just the right pitch that would separate them from the rest. And their words alone would bridge the distance, personalizing for him the impersonal chore of signing merchandise for money. And they also desperately wanted different slices of the same pie for him to soak in his moment back in 1974 and carry it with him with his ease and joviality and reverence as they did. They approached the line and pleaded with their eyes for him to regale them with a story and a laugh about 715, an anecdote, just one golden nugget from the man himself about that night, which would make his glory a little bit more theirs. But Henry would not accommodate this request. A photo and a handshake and a signature would have to be enough. When he did pause with a glint of energy in his eye, it was not for a fan who had triggered a warm baseball memory. It was at that moment he looked to his left up at the television, put down the vanilla milkshake he had finally been handed, and saw the tennis player Venus Williams finish off her match in the Wimbledon quarterfinals. It's going to be Venus and Serena, Henry said, and Venus is going to win the whole thing again. And so to me, that example is how difficult it was for, for Henry. And one of the things that we had talked about after that day when I had said to him, how do you do this? Because it was very clear that for anyone that knows him or for anyone that listens to him, this was not a happy time in his life. It was not a moment where you would broach with him, uh, you would broach with him very easily. It was hard for him, but it gave us, the fans, an immense amount of pleasure. So it's a very difficult balance for him. And so finally, I remember this very well as well. He had been living with the conflict for over a half century, was convinced nobody cared about the price of the moment that gave them so much joy, and so Henry retrenched and let Hank play pretend dutifully and professionally, signing everything. By the way, nobody can sign like Hank Aaron. It's amazing how much he can sign. Uh, lithographs, batting helmets, bats, baseball cards, with the remove and distance of an insurance agent. Like an insurance, being Hank, after all, was sometimes a job. Yet he did not blame them for loving Hank without understanding Henry, or more accurately, for not making the distinction between the two men who lived in one body, providing the foundation for the other. Hundreds of fans arrived at an ice cream shop for their wide-angle view of 715, and he obliged. And I remember he was getting into the cab, and he finally said to me, you know what the hardest thing is? What nobody wants to understand is me. People want their memories of me to be my memories of me, Henry Aaron said. But you know what? They're not. So I think that kind of, I try to at least give you an idea of uh, what I saw from him. And it was difficult because this was one of the first times that he and I had actually spent a few hours together. And it was very difficult to try to understand what it's like to be that famous. Because every time he even stepped away from the, from the back curtain when he wasn't signing, somebody was walking toward him with a business card or with some sort of story or some sort of offer or a pitch or something. And I was thinking, I, I wouldn't even want to leave the house if this is what life was like. But he was so gracious. And he, would never, he never said no to anybody. He just went through it and through it and through it. And so for me, this was a journey that continued on in, in terms of trying to understand Henry Aaron. And one of the things that struck me so much about him was the box that we've put him in in the press, that we spend a lot of time talking about Hank Aaron and it's always been in comparison with someone else. It's always been in comparison when he first came up in 1954. It was in comparison to Willie Mays. And then after that, it was in comparison when it was his time to break Ruth's record with Babe Ruth and the worthiness of him breaking that record. 
And then when it was time for his record to be broken by Barry Bonds, it was comparison with him, the, with Bonds, uh, the man of honor and integrity against this man who was facing a federal indictment. But what never happened was the accurate comparison, which was the comparison to Jackie Robinson. And said, this is what Henry Aaron really wanted to be, which was a person who used his ability to hit a ball with a stick to make people's lives better and to make the lives of his people better. And it wasn't until the mid-1960s, and he'd already been in the league about 10 years, where he began to take more of an active role in changing his own narrative. When he first came into the league, he was a caricature, and the press was not very kind to him. And I understood it when, when we were talking and I was talking with Alan trying to get them to agree to let me talk to him, to agree to have him be part of the project. You go back and you look at the archives and, and the one thing about a book project is that you'll find whether or not you like to research. If you don't like to research, don't write a book. And to go through all that microfilm and to see how he was portrayed in the press, I understood it. I said, I wouldn't talk to anybody either. I wouldn't want to do a lot of... Uh, media or respond to a lot of media requests because, as he said, they always get it wrong. Every time someone talked to me, they got it wrong, and then I had to correct the correction. And so I just said it, was no, it just wasn't worth it anymore. And so there was a time when he first came into the big leagues that in the lead of newspapers, they referred to him as step and fetch it in the first paragraph of a story about Hank Aaron and that his teammates, uh, Joe Adcock, referred to him as snowshoes, and that uh, they always used the word when you talked about him uh, shuffling. And this is in the, this is in the newspaper. And, and I remember asking him that, you know, I do a lot of research, and nobody referred to Jackie Robinson as shuffling, and no one referred to Willie Mays as shuffling, and why, why you? And then, you know, of course, you realize that he couldn't answer that. His response was, ask them. But, um, but you realize that for me as a journalist and as an African-American journalist, it was time to, to do some rewriting of the narrative. And then so in the mid-1960s, as Henry began to do this himself, you could see how things changed. And I write that the mainstream press did not know quite what to do with this new Henry Aaron especially the Henry Aaron who and his emerging sensibility channeled the civil rights rhetoric that sowed the seeds for what would become the, black, the, the mindset of black Americans. The urgency concerning civil rights revealed itself on many important fronts, but the insular baseball world, the writers, the coaches, the players, the executives, they were confounded by what appeared to be sudden and expansive dimensions to Henry's character. And this would be true for the rest of his playing career through the turbulent 1960s and 70s when it was difficult to be an American and not have an opinion of the massive upheaval of the times. In general, the writers didn't know much to expand on, who did, uh, did not do much to expand on the emerging threat of civil rights, though a few writers such as Dick Schaap and through the confluence of a national civil rights movement and the growing outspokenness of black professional athletes, not only to be a fascinating story, but also in many ways an explanation for the drive and hunger of this generation of exceptional performers. While the daily press and the more austere Sports Illustrated were slow to take up the issue, Sport Magazine was one of the few that excelled in exploring the impact of the burgeoning civil rights movement on the sports industry. And I think that's one of the tough things about Henry, and it's, it's, it happens even today. I remember when the book came out, we had an interview, we were trying to get uh, one of the NPR stations to interview uh, either me or, or Henry if he wanted to for the project. And one of the producers said, no, I don't have any interest in talking to Henry Aaron because in the 1960s he didn't do anything for civil rights. And, and I was thinking, here we go again. And it's a very interesting thing because Bill White, who was one of his contemporaries, played for the, the Giants and uh, the Cardinals, was really good about this. And he was one of the guys who really tried to make sure I understood what I was getting into uh, and trying to understand the, the, the mindset of, of an athlete who was born in the South. And he was saying that you really can't be as 
you really can't be as harsh on them as you may think, because for you, your life wasn't it wasn't their life. You can't, you can't try to say, well, this is what I would have done because you're not him. You didn't grow up where he grew up. And so there was this constant feeling that, that Hank Aaron didn't do a lot for civil rights. And it's patently untrue. One of the hard things that I had to come to a conclusion about was that I really do feel that one of the things that happened to him as a, as a player was he happened to come up at a period when you had extremely charismatic professional athletes who were saying the same things he was saying. You had Muhammad Ali, you had Jim Brown, you had Bill Russell, and then later you had Arthur Ashe. So you had a lot of players who were saying the same thing. And I think that Henry's voice got drowned out a little bit because those people were so much more geared toward the television era, and, and he wasn't. But that doesn't mean that he wasn't interested. And I think that for years, people misunderstood his passion. And, and one of the things that, that I thought was even more telling about him was if you compare him to some of the other athletes who were saying these things about the need for change, and Jackie Robinson included, was that the Aaron family lived it more than the, more than the rest because of where they came from. So it was very, uh, I understood in talking to him and doing more and more of the research why he was so reticent about trying to explain himself because it seemed to never do any good. So, one of the things that I felt was really important for him, in fact, we had dinner last night and we, we ended up talking about this, was when it was time to come to Atlanta, he didn't want to come here. And as he said, you know, I've lived in the South and I don't want to come back here. You know, my kids can go to school wherever they want. I've lived in the South and I don't want to live there again, Henry told a reporter in 1964. This is my home. I've lived here since I was a kid, 19 years old. We can go anywhere we want in Milwaukee. I don't know what would happen in Atlanta. And one of the amazing things that did happen when he came to Atlanta was being part of the civil rights movement. And we sat down a couple of weeks ago with him and I had the pleasure of interviewing both him and Andrew Young and, and President Carter as well, who was just fantastic with his time. And he was talking about how you had this wonderful moment of, in time that during this period, and the Atlanta Braves, of all, of all things, a baseball team, helped legitimize this region. And that you wouldn't think of it today as something as silly as a sports team having that much impact. But Hank Aaron always talks about not being as important as Jackie Robinson. But you do have to remember that he was the first black superstar to play in this region. And that is pretty significant. And I kind of felt as though there was this while I was working on this, that the narrative has just been all wrong. I was thinking that everything that I've kind of known about this man has just been incorrect. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important for, for anybody, but especially I feel for, for African Americans to begin to try at the very least to take control of your own narrative and write your history and tell your story before somebody else does. Or before that institutional memory is no longer there. I think one of the things that I had the pleasure of doing was talking to uh, Ed Scott, the, the man who had discovered Henry Aaron in Mobile. And he just passed away right before the book came out. And I was just so happy that the timing worked out that I got to talk to him because he's gone now. And that everything he told me, I would have missed it if you didn't take advantage of the time that you had. And so one thing that I felt was really important about Henry and about what he was coming into here was, <clears throat> I mean, it wasn't just an irrational fear of the South. I mean, it was, it was real. Um, and this was one thing that he had talked about, uh, about some of these negotiations that were taking place about what he was going to encounter here. And Bill Bartholomew, the owner of the Braves, was trying to negotiate with Ivan Allen about just what the environment was going to be like for African-American players. During Bartholomew's and uh, John McHale's secret meetings with the Atlanta people, particular, particularly Mayor Allen and the ubiquitous Bob Woodruff, head of Coca-Cola, and the most powerful businessman in the region, the Braves had been promised that seating in the Atlanta stadium would not be segregated. All tickets would be available to all fans. 
Black fans could sit wherever they wanted, wherever they could afford. And Allen had, <clears throat> excuse me, and Allen had promised there would be no nefarious pricing schemes that would promote de facto segregation. Allen told Bartholomew that the restrooms, concessions, and all public facilities would be integrated. But what if those were just words, bargaining chips necessary to get an important deal done, to keep the best player on the club from making a fuss? The Braves weren't going to refuse a multi-million dollar move to Atlanta just because of the racial concerns of the black, uh, of black people or, the, or the, the black players had. Had Henry's objections been a consideration, the team wouldn't have considered moving to the South in the first place. Even if the Braves had kept their promises, Henry's first wife, Barbara, had thought, she would have to live in the world beyond the ballpark. She'd have to take the kids to school and shop and deal with an environment she regarded with dread. What most whites didn't understand, and indeed it was virtually impossible to do so, was the level of humiliation blacks in the South were forced to endure. In later years, when the confrontations of the civil rights movement would be documented in film and the other media, the standard humiliations of separate drinking facilities and restrooms would become so cliched and completely uncomprehensible to a new generation of black and white Americans, their mentions would lose virtually all power to shock. It was not just the big humiliations that had to be borne, but the constant, daily, nagging small ones. The depth of the racial prejudice of just what whites truly believed about blacks, however, could not be underestimated. A year before Bartholomew and Allen first began secretly negotiating the move to Atlanta, the relationship between Atlanta's black community and Riches, the largest department store in the Southeast, had already begun to deteriorate. For years, blacks were angered by the treatment they encountered at Riches while spending their hard-earned money. Quote, not only were blacks forbidden to sit at the Riches lunch counter, wrote Gary Pomerantz, in a great book where Peachtree meets Sweet Auburn, uh, they also couldn't try on clothes before buying them. The Atlanta department store's rule of thumb was that white customers would not buy clothes if they knew blacks had once sampled them. And that was something I never knew. I, I didn't know that was, it was kind of a, a shock put it that way. And when I talked to Henry about it, he just kind of shook his head and nodded. And, and I remember saying to him, I don't think I could have done any of this. I mean, you were, I was born in 1968. And that was essentially, in, in retrospect, it was the first year where everybody in this country were covered under the exact same laws. Before then, we weren't. And so it's only been in my lifetime where everybody has actually been equal under the law. And then, Henry was eating uh, some fried oysters last night, and he says, oh yeah, you would have done all right with it, or you'd be dead. <laughs> that kind of changed my attitude about it. But, um, but you get an idea of what was taking place here and why this was so significant. And even though Jackie Robinson gets a great deal of the credit for 1947 and integrating, Henry Aaron had a lot to do with this next wave, this next region, and the, uh, the next chapter in the the story of integration. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting about it as well is that for him, as a person who wanted to be this person of substance, who wanted to be someone who was known outside of the batter's box, had he stayed in Milwaukee, the entire narrative for him would have changed. I don't think anyone would have looked at him as a person who was as important. He would have been comfortable in Milwaukee, but he would have been just another ball player. But to be here with Andrew Young and Dr. King and, and Ralph Abernathy and, and everything that was taking place right here, he was in the center of it. So in his, in his own way, he was, he was moving into the heart of the action without even knowing it. And I remember asking him that last night. If you, I said, do you realize that this in its own way worked out? And he's like, it worked out pretty well. And so, I think all of that, when you begin to move toward, obviously, his big moment when he breaks the record, it's this kind of amalgam of pressure. And finally, the pressure gets released after he does break the record. But you can kind of understand, with all of these things taking place, why this was so hard for him. And I know that a new generation of fans, and, and, and of course all of us, I mean, as time goes on, we have a difficult time understanding why. Okay, it's been, it's been 36 years, why does it still bother you? Well, because this is the, these are the facts of his life. And it's not up to any of us to, 
tell him what's supposed to matter and what's not supposed to matter. And one of the hard things, and I was talking with Frank about this earlier, was when you're trying to write about somebody who's been written about so much, and especially one moment that's been written about so much, the 715 when he broke the record, it's like, okay, how do you find something new? How do you, what do you pull new out of something that's been written about a thousand times? It's the defining moment of his story and this has to be the defining chapter. You know, if this is going to be a good book, it's got to be the defining account of this. But everyone's written about it so much. What do you say? How do you say it? And so I decided that maybe the way to do it was to not talk about Hank Aaron at all, to tell his story naturally, but to talk about everybody else who was there that night, to find as many people as I could. Because one thing that happens in, in race, when you talk about race in America, it usually does just kind of bog down to this conversation of, you know, ask the black guy what you know, his experiences were, without realizing that racism dehumanizes all of us. It ruins everything for everybody. And one great conversation I'd had was with Gene Conley, who was one of Henry's teammates back in the 50s with Milwaukee. And he was telling me this great story about how back in Oklahoma he had taken a, a black friend when he was a kid to the swimming pool. And this kid was one of his best friends and they went swimming and they got up and they left. And right before he left, the, who, the manager of the pool told him, don't ever bring that kid here again or bad things are gonna happen to you. And so here's Gene Conley, he's 82 years old now, telling me the story about how because of the times, I lost one of my best friends, and who knows what we could have been together as friends, and that got taken away from me. So one of the things that I wanted to do was to try to talk to everybody else who was there that night, to talk about their America, and what the, how their America brought them to this moment that belonged to Henry Aaron. And one of the guys that I really, really enjoyed talking to was uh, the toy cannon, was Jimmy Wynn. And he was just great because he, he remembered so much, and it was just really bizarre because so much of that night broke down along racial lines. And when you talk to each player, I had a, the Dodgers were just fantastic in terms of their, their recollections. And everybody remembers, of course, the, the two kids running out onto, right at second base. And Davey Lopes was at second base, and he's standing there, and he watches these two kids, and he said, I didn't even know how they got on the field. I didn't even see them. And so it was all happening so fast. And of course, Henry's bodyguard, Calvin Wardlaw, is in the stands and he's got, he's got a 45 in his binoculars case. And he puts his hand into the binoculars case when he sees the kids running out. And Ron Say is standing over at third base. And of course, he's at third base and he sees Henry and he sees these two kids coming. And Say is thinking, this is it. They're, they're going to come to kill him. And he doesn't know what to do. And he's standing there. And it's just an amazing you know, when you're doing this panorama about what everybody's thinking in this millisecond of time, and then when he realizes that they put their hands out and slap him on the back and realizes that they, they've come in peace, he said, I wanted to go walk over and kind of reach out and shake his hand too, but I realized that after everything Henry had been through, this was his moment and he deserved to walk alone. And I thought that was very poignant. Jimmy Wynn, however, I was asking him about what he felt standing in, because he's in center field, he's far away. And I remember asking him um, <coughs> what he felt, and this is what he told me. In center field, Jimmy Wynn playing for the, for the opposing team had decided that he wanted Henry to hit a home run on this night right now. Like Mike Marshall, Wynn had, only, had been focused only on assimilating with his new team, it was his first year with the Dodgers and what the Dodgers needed to do to beat Cincinnati to finally win the division and get back to the World Series, a place the Dodgers hadn't been to since 1966 when they were destroyed by Baltimore. At the time, Wynn was in Houston, the first star player for the old expansion Colt 45s, which by then would be known as the Astros. He had known Henry only slightly, the two had met briefly over the years, and Wynn respected Henry immensely. Wynn would recall that he did not think of Henry breaking the record until he'd reached 714, and then he began to assess Henry not only in baseball terms, but in historical context. He thought of his father, Joe Wynn, when Jimmy was a boy growing up in Cincinnati. Joe Wynn was a ball player first, playing in the industrial leagues in Ohio and Kentucky, 
but his generation couldn't dream of playing in the major leagues. Joe Wynn was the best player Jimmy had ever seen, and he had told his father he wanted to follow in his footsteps, to which the elder Wynn re uh, replied, no, you have your own footsteps. In between pitches, Jimmy Wynn thought about his own road to the major leagues and the humiliations he'd endured because he wanted to be a baseball player. On numerous occasions, when the environment grew too rough, he would turn to Big Joe Wynn for comfort, sometimes to plead with his father to return home. And Joe Wynn was always unsympathetic, telling him, stay put, you're in the world now. Jimmy Wynn remembered a game in Palatka, Florida, in which, probably took, which probably took place in 1962 or 63, when he was playing for the Tampa Tarpons, a farm club of the Reds. Wynn was playing third base and a pair of whites in the stands, Cat called out to him, hey nigger, where's your tail? Jimmy Wynn stared straight ahead. Hey nigger, I'm talking to you. The Tarpons manager, a white man named Herschel Freeman, called time to talk to his young third baseman. He asked me, Jimmy, are you all right? I told him I was, and I told him, hey, let's just play baseball. But these two just wouldn't stop, Jimmy Wynn recalled. They were throwing the N-word around and asking me where my tail was, and they kept doing it. And finally, Herschel Freeman called time and went up to the stands and grabbed one of them and said, his name is Jimmy Wynn. If you don't want to call him that, then call him Mr. Wynn. If you don't want to call him that, then say nothing. And if you don't, I will visit you once again. And then the next words I heard from them were, come on, Jimmy, let's go. Come on, Jimmy. <laughs> And in a flash, the dense myth mythic fog of the evening of who was the greatest player, or who was the greater player, or who Ruth or Aaron had the greater impact, began to clear. And there was nothing left about the night of April 8, 1974, for Jimmy Wynn, the famed toy cannon, except one crystallizing thought. Quote, it wasn't about numbers. It wasn't even really about Babe Ruth. It was about him breaking a white man's record. Everything he went through was happening because he put, him in, he put himself in a position to break a white man's record. You see, that record, it belonged to them. And in a lot of ways, to them, the ones who wrote those letters and said those things, Henry was taking it away from them and giving it to us. He was giving us a little something more than what we'd had, something we'd never had. And I thought that was really powerful. And obviously Henry breaks the record and on it goes. And everybody remembers Milo Hamilton's call. And you know, there's a new home run champion of all time and it's Henry Aaron. And that received more attention. And not to slight Milo, but as I say, it was the legend Vin Scully who offered the more poignant, textured and lasting call of the moment. For 25 seconds after he'd hit the home run, Vince Scully stayed quiet, allowing the fans to speak to America for him as Henry rounded the bases. And then he continued with the words that would make a career. It is, I cannot do a Vince Scully impersonation, so bear with me. It is over. And for the first time in a long time, that poker face of Aaron shows the tremendous relief. What a marvelous moment for baseball. What a marvelous moment for Atlanta and for the state of Georgia. What a marvelous moment for the country and the world. A black man is getting a standing ovation in the Deep South for breaking a record of an all-time baseball idol. And it is a great moment for us, and particularly for Henry Aaron. And that's why Vin Scully's a legend. <laughs> and so when it all ended, of course, the thing that I thought was, that told the most of it all was, of course, Henry said, I'm, I'm glad it's over. But Wayne Minshew, who was the sports writer for the uh, Atlanta Constitution, I had a great interview with him, and he, he said it best as well. I said that the Braves closed the clubhouse for a half an hour after the game, I'm sorry, for an hour after the game, and celebrated the moment as a team. There were plans for celebrations throughout the baseball world whenever Hank Aaron came to town, for the first time as the all-time leader in home runs. When the doors to the Braves clubhouse opened, Henry shook a few hands and offered a few words to the writers, the most telling to Wayne Minshew. Quote, all he said was, I'm going home now. That was it. I'm going home. And so to me, that exchange juxtaposed against him signing that day in New York, 
kind of said everything about that distance between the moment for the fans and what it meant to him. And that told me a lot, and it's one of the things that happens when you do a project, when you kind of spend that long on somebody's life. You hope that it all comes together, and you hope that you do it justice. But you never can tell. But to me, I thought this was very powerful. And it was one of the reasons why I, I went in the direction that I went. And so I know I've talked everybody's ear off, and I'd be happy to take some questions. I wanted to, to add just by saying, by the end, when we had gone through this entire story, and I had wished, of course, that I had spoken more with him, and I had wished that, as always, we had a function in Cooperstown a couple of weeks ago, and Henry and Billy were gracious enough to invite me, and I didn't think they were gonna, because it was the first time I'd spoken to him since the book came out, so I didn't know if they liked it or not. And so I was scared when I walked in there, and I saw Billy, and I kind of, Turn my head. She's like, no, no, come on over. It's all right. It's, it's all right. And, and we sat down and had dinner, and there was about 150 people there. And I was looking at the room, and I'm thinking, sources. <laughs> <laughs> where were you? Oh, yeah, where were you? It was, uh, the book would have been so much better if I had the opportunity to talk to everybody, but that's how it goes. But when it was all done, I felt that we, I felt that we kind of understood each other. And I tried to understand him. And I close by saying, Henry's America was fading. In 2007, he traveled to Milwaukee to attend a dinner celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Milwaukee Braves' only championship. Only 13 Braves remained. Bill Bruton had died in a car crash in 1995. The accident was caused by a heart attack while he was driving near his home in Delaware. Joe Adcock had died in 1999, but not before meeting with Henry to apologize for his racial attitudes when they were teammates. Eddie Matthews died of a heart attack in 2001, Warren Spahn in 2003, Lou Burdett in 2007. In the most complete sense, Henry Aaron had won. Winding through the city of Milwaukee is the Hank Aaron State Trail, nearly 10 miles of sanctuary for bikers, runners, and skateboarders. In 2004, the city of Eau Claire erected a statue commemorating the 60 days Aaron spent there. In Mobile and Atlanta, the Aaron name adorns streets and parks. At a safe remove, when there were no more points to prove, no more misunderstandings to correct, no more slights to solve. The, comp the competitions ended and the deeds could finally speak for themselves. Henry Aaron lowered his guard and allowed the warmth of the sun to bathe his face. Quote, not too long ago, we went away for 15 days on a cruise to the Panama Canal, he said. I had been on cruises before, but never on the water for that long a time. I remember, the, I remember when the boat was in the canal, in that narrow space, I looked out at the blue ocean and I saw the birds swoop down into the water and then settle on the land. And then I understood how much I wanted to be like them, free. I leaned over to my wife and I told her that it was at that very moment that I finally felt like them. No one was asking me about baseball. The people that were around us weren't interested in me because I played baseball. I was as free as a bird, and I told my wife, I said, I've never felt this free in my life. And, uh, and when he said that, I thought that was, that was poetry. So thank you all for listening. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. You go, one of the, one of the amazing things about a civilized society is how much record keeping we actually have. And if you go to the Library of Congress, there is a folder, it's a gigantic folder, it just says Jackie Robinson hyphen correspondence. And there are, he was an amazingly proficient letter writer. And I'm like going through this and I'm thinking, okay, this is a book about Hank Aaron, but I gotta get this stuff in here somewhere because it's just so fascinating. And the connection, of course, was the fact that in 1960, Henry ended up campaigning for Kennedy, and Jackie Robinson hated John F. Kennedy. And Jackie Robinson was campaigning for Rockefeller. And over the course of 1960-61, Robinson and Nixon had struck up a, a friendship. They weren't classmates because, and Nixon was much older than, uh, than Jackie. 
but they both went to UCLA. And Nixon was a huge fan of Robinson's because he remembered him as an athlete at UCLA. And Robinson was a lifelong Republican. And they began a friendship based out of the 1960 campaign. And Robinson was a, actually no, not, it wasn't Rockefeller, it was Humphrey. And Robinson was a supporter of Humphrey, even though Humphrey was a Democrat, but he was convinced that Humphrey couldn't beat Kennedy and he was gonna throw his support to Nixon. And so Nixon's people had written a letter to, uh, uh, one of Nixon's operatives had written a letter to, to Nixon saying, Jackie Robinson has an incredible amount of power in the black community and maybe we can cultivate him. And so that was the beginning of their public correspondence. And ironically, because when, when Jackie also had a column in the New York Post, and it was a syndicated column and he had an incredible amount of influence, that the Kennedy clan needed to find somebody black and somebody powerful to offset Jackie Robinson's influence. So of course in 1960, who was the most popular black man in Milwaukee? Hank Aaron. And so that's how Henry Aaron began his essentially 50 year relationship with the Democratic Party. And so the response, I actually do, do have the response and I didn't put it in because, I mean, I think I put it in, but I think they cut it because it was getting too long. One of my editors said, this book needs a diet. <laughs> and, um, and the response, I mean, they were friends. I mean, they were, they were really close friends. And then they finally fell out. I think Robinson and, and Nixon had a falling out finally when it became clear that, that Nixon's politics and his friendship with Jackie Robinson were not intertwined. And Robinson finally kind of realized that uh, maybe he had been taken advantage of a little bit. But between 1960 and 1968, uh, if you read those letters between, between Robinson and Nixon, it's one of the more bizarre relationships, but I think it was pretty sincere. Well, I think that because it was 54, I think that you were, I mean, if you're in baseball, the game had been integrated for seven years. So it wasn't as though what he was going through was anything that hadn't been experienced by Larry Doby and Jackie Robinson and, and, and a lot of the players who had come before him. So it really wasn't anything as vitriolic as what Robinson encountered. I think that by then, I think the Chase Hotel, which was the notorious Chase Hotel, I think by 54 they had finally integrated and I think it became clear that integration was not going to be a fad. I think where he had the worst, the worst uh, relations were in, excuse me, the South Atlantic League when he was in Jacksonville. That was the period where he was on his own, where he was the Jackie Robinson of the minor leagues, where he, that league hadn't been integrated until he got there. And I was so happy and mad at the same time because over, over dinner he's telling me a story about how when he would play second base in Jacksonville on the road, some of the adults would have their kids run over by the first baseline, right in the mid outfield between first base and, and right field. And he's playing second base and the kids would throw rocks at the back of his head. And so right when the ball was pitched, somebody would try to throw a rock at his head to break his concentration. And so he was like, it was raining rocks in the fourth inning. And I'm thinking, why didn't you tell me the story for the book? <laughs> and um, that was the stuff. And I, you know, he was talking about how these things became so pervasive that they all, that the black players at Horace Garner and Felix Mantilla, and, and he, they ended up making a joke out of it. And he says you just had to, had to deflect it all with humor, because nobody would have believed it if you couldn't laugh at it. No, it made sense. It certainly made sense. And, and in fact, Robinson gave an interview right when Kennedy announced his presidency that said that I would never, I could never support someone who knew so little about black people. Well, it's a difficult thing and I think that one of the problems when you do those kind of interviews is that it's kind of hard to admit you're on the wrong side of history. I mean, history kind of proved that you kind of a discredited position. So no, I didn't get a chance to find anybody who said, yeah, I wrote a hate mail letter to him. 
I would have liked that. I met a lot of people who said, I wrote letters supporting him, but I didn't meet anybody who had, who had said, the closest one, believe it or not, was somebody who's pretty near and dear to this town, was Furman Bisher. And he and I had a fascinating, kind of chilling interview a few, uh, a couple of years ago, where he had written the definitive piece on Henry Aaron, the first one in 1956 in the, in the Saturday Evening Post, which was just a devastating portrait. You know, essentially said that, I mean, you know, for all of Henry's natural rhythm, he doesn't dance a step, you know, that kind of stuff. And, um, and I, you know, and, and I think Furman's 90 years old now, or 91 or something like that, and, and I know I'm on his turf, so I'm gonna tread lightly. But um, in our conversation, I remember asking him, I said, well, you know, sir, how do you, how do you feel about what you wrote 50 years ago? And he didn't budge. He didn't budge, not an inch. He didn't say, well, those, you know, and most people will say, well, you know, those were the times and that's how it was, and, you know, obviously I wouldn't write that again today. Didn't budge, you know. He said, Henry Aaron is very unsophisticated and easily led. Well, I think one of the hard parts about this story, about any of the stories, is that I think that Henry Aaron really got a raw deal by geography. Because one of the things that I, that I argue in the book, and I, I believe this, is that he, is the, he was the first superstar black athlete who did not have the benefit of either growing up in California or playing in a big city in the East or in Chicago. Ernie Banks is from Dallas, he played in Chicago. Willie Mays was from Birmingham, but he played in New York. Jackie Robinson had California and he played in New York. So you had these guys, you had, you had a media that was a little bit more sympathetic about racial issues on the East Coast. You had, you had writers, and especially in New York because you know, New York feeds on itself. It's a, it's a gigantic monster where everything Willie did had to be epic because if he was epic, then we were epic as New Yorkers. That's what New Yorkers do. Well, I'm from Boston, but I know the New York <laughs> attitude. And, um, but that helped Willie, and that helped Jackie. Jackie had Roger Kahn. Willie Mays had Charlie Einstein and had Jimmy Cannon and Dick Young and all those guys. And, and Ernie Banks had... Uh, the Chicago, you know, writers, you know, Mike Royko and those guys who, who, who created their legend for them. You needed that because the newspaper was the calling card. I mean, if you were going to learn anything, you weren't at his house, so you learned what you read. Henry had nobody in Milwaukee, and then he had Furman Bisher down here. He didn't have that person who said, this is a legend. In fact, the closest thing he had was out in Los Angeles, was Jim Murray. Jim Murray loved Hank Aaron. If you go back and read Jim Murray's columns, I mean, he always said that Aaron was better than Mays, better than everybody. And if Jim Murray had been, if Aaron had either played out there or if Jim Murray had been a columnist in where Henry had played, the entire narrative of Henry Aaron would have been very different. Yeah, it's in his house. <laughs> he's got it. <laughs> yeah, he's got it. I mean, the Hall of Fame has a little bit of it. And, um, it's there. If you go to Cooperstown, you can read some of it. Um, Henry's got a lot of it up in a shoe, couple of shoe boxes in, in his house. And um, I mean, it's real. It's not something out of his imagination, not at all. And um, it's really stupid. I mean, when you, when you read the stuff, it's just childish, but it's real. Was any of it taken seriously enough to be followed up? Yeah, and when and if he if he would have let me, I would have been able. I I, I asked and I kind of got shot down on it. I mean, because because Henry's a living person, you can't you can't go into his FBI file. But he could he could have allowed me to do it, and he didn't. He's like, oh, I don't know if I really want to go there. And I asked him, Have you ever seen your FBI file? And he said, No. I said, You might want to just yeah, you might just want to go take a look. Yeah, you might want to take a look. I mean, we're just finding out now that Ted Kennedy passed what was in his file and all the death threats that were there. And so the FBI certainly took it seriously. I know that the, um, the Braves, I have a section in there with Bob Hope who didn't think it was as serious. He thought, you know, he thought the same way a lot of us think. Is somebody really crazy enough to take a shot at a baseball player because he's playing baseball? And 
Yeah. I mean, I've always felt, not that I want to give anybody any ideas, but I've always felt that one of the most bizarre things in our country is that it doesn't happen to athletes. I mean, they are naked out there. They are completely and totally vulnerable. You've had really one major thing, and that was with Monica Seles. And, and outside of that, it's remarkable that, that nothing happens to players. Um, answer one is yesterday. <laughs> the book's already out. Um, this was hard for him. I, I got the impression that, and I, and I wrote it in the, in, in, the, in the source notes, he was not very enthusiastic about the book. He wasn't hostile to it. He just wasn't enthusiastic about it. However, he did do the greatest thing that any biographer could want. He didn't make the phone call to all of his people that said, hey, there's a guy writing a book about me. Don't talk to him. And that's usually what most famous people do to keep people from talking. I'll cut you off. I'll cut you, I'll cut you loose if you talk. And so he didn't do that. In fact, he, you know, everybody I talked to, I mean, with the exception of President Carter and President Clinton, because I don't think they need permission to talk about anybody, um, but everybody else pretty much said, I called Henry first and checked you out. So that was, he could have shut this down in a second if he wanted to, and he didn't. And I was really, really grateful for that because it, the time that it took for him, you know, I started the project in 2006. And so the fact that we were in late 2007 and he still hadn't spoken to me really had me wondering if this was going to fail because I had started a project and couldn't finish it if he didn't talk. It's a much better project now that he's part of it. Yeah, nothing. Nothing. And that's why I wrote in, in one of the chapters that, that what he did to me was more remarkable than what Jackie Robinson did, simply because, and Jackie Robinson would have completely disapproved of what Henry Aaron did, which was to bet your life on baseball. Jackie Robinson was a veteran. He was educated. He, he, went to, you know, he had a college degree. Henry Aaron had nothing except really quick wrists and ability and great eyesight. And he said, I remember we were in Cooperstown a couple of years ago and I asked him about that. What was next for you? And he said, it was not one, two, or three with me. Everything, it had to work. I had no backup plan. It was that or I was gonna be making a couple of dollars a week in a factory. I had nothing but baseball. Well, I think, I mean, I, the, the South being in a complicated place is an understatement. And I felt like, in, in, in my case, certainly, um, I had two major, major concerns about doing this book. The first was that I was seven years old when he retired. I never saw him play. So how do you recreate someone that you don't have a firsthand memory of? So you better get that right. And you got to talk to as many people as you can who have memories like yours and have memories of people who saw him and visualized what he was. The second major concern, which is probably the first, is that I'm not from the South. And I didn't want to fall into all of these stereotypes that somebody from Boston might have about the South. This is not my home. So you had to really, really spend a lot of time trying to talk to people about people who are from here, whose hands are in the soil, people whose roots are here. Tell me about your home. Tell me about this place and explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old, and then explain it again, and then explain it again, and then talk to other people to make sure that you've got enough of a cross-section that maybe a little bit of it comes clear, because nobody wants to be patronized. And, and if somebody from Alabama had written about Boston, you better know what you're talking about, because the Bostonians are gonna look at you and go, you don't get this place. To answer your question, I think, I think he does. I, I do, I think that uh, it's hard for me to answer because I'm not him, but one of the things that I've been trying to get at as a theme was which vision of America wins? Is it the America that when Henry Aaron was born in the depression and when he was a little kid, his dad would go into a store and when somebody white came in, he'd have to give up his place in line and let somebody white go in front of him. You think about that kind of humiliation and what that does to a kid and what that does to a father and what it can do to a family over generations. Or is it the vision of America where he's a 76 year old man and you've got an African American in the White House and you've slept in the White House and you've been around the world and you are, 
you are routinely recognized as a national icon. He is the American dream. Yet you kind of realize too that you can't have one without the other. So I think that from an intellectual level, yeah, I think he understands. And of course, Lewis, you could probably answer that better because you know him far better than I do. I think he does. I think, I think Henry Aaron, if you sat him down and you asked him, does he recognize his place, and not just globally, but does he recognize his place in terms of, of what it meant to have him come to the South and succeed and to let people gravitate toward him? I think he does, and I think he's very, very proud of it. Well, I think that, I think that first, that the Braves are just like everybody else and especially in the 70s. And if it weren't for Ted Turner, I don't know what happens to, to, to Henry Aaron as a baseball man. And I remember talking to, to, to him when I, when I interviewed him. And of course, the first thing he said was, call me Ted. <laughs> I'm like, Mr. Turner, thanks for talking to me. And then he immediately went on to say, look, that this organization belittled this man. And I thought that was fascinating for him to just come out and say that that they had the same old paternalistic notions of not just uh, black players, but players in general. And that, uh, that when they let him go, they let, they let him go very cynically. And that if it weren't for Ted Turner, maybe Henry Aaron doesn't get the opportunity to be farm director. He doesn't get those opportunities to show that there was more to him than just being a hitter. Um, today, today I think that I think that all of these organizations, excuse me, especially when it comes to retention and the development of African American ballplayers, I think they've all missed the boat. I think that they have, you know, my attitude has always been, I fight with Bud Selig about this all the time. He knows it chapter and verse. If you look for players, you will find them. And right now, baseball, the Braves, the Red Sox, all of them, they're looking for players in two places where you're not gonna find African Americans, college, in Latin America. So then how do you get upset that there are no black players? And what they do is they blame the player, they blame the black people. Oh, well, you know, they like basketball and they like football better. No, develop the player and you'll find the player. The reason why there is a Hank Aaron and there's a Jackie Robinson and all those guys was because back then you were looking for players in the Negro Leagues and that's why you found them. But if you don't look for them and you don't develop them, then how could you expect to have 15, 20% uh, black participation like you had back in the 60s and 70s. Sure, very much so. I, obviously, I think the two, the two men in his life growing up, well, one was his dad and the other one was Ed Scott. I mean, Ed Scott took an interest, and that's the very first thing that I think any kid needs is someone to take an interest. And when you have that, then you can maximize your potential because you don't even know you have potential unless somebody has taken an interest. And I remember talking to, to, to Ed about this, and, and he was telling me that, um, that his family didn't recognize, in fact, Henry said this last night, that you know, it didn't come from his dad, his, his baseball playing ability. Um, that his dad wasn't the one who nurtured the baseball side, it was, it was Ed Scott. And Ed told me about how he was so afraid of uh, Stella Aaron, of, of Henry's mother. And he was, he was, I said, you're afraid of her? He goes, yes, I was afraid of her. And I said, why were you afraid of her? And he says, well, because I knew she was gonna shoot me down. And so I used to hang out around the corner from her house and wait for her to kind of sit outside on the porch so then maybe I could go in so I didn't have to knock on the door. She would already be outside. And I used to tell her that, you know, if this was Satchel Paige we're talking about, I wouldn't bother you. But you really don't know what a special talent you've got here. And I think that on the religious side, certainly it came from his mom. I mean, they, I mean, she was, she was the glue of that family, and she was, the, she was the religious epicenter of it. I mean, everyone said that Henry was always a mama's boy anyway, and that she was the strength of it all. And, and to this day, I mean, when, when, when Henry goes out and he does a signing or wherever he goes, um, you know, that money goes to the church right down here. And so he's... Um, He's a very religious man, and I think he understands that the, the, um, his spiritual center has a lot to do with his strength. Different parents? Unless he wanted to be a plumber. I mean, that was it. I mean, you either played, I mean, back then, 
Back then, you played or you didn't play. I mean, there was no uh, going to your agent and demanding a trade. That's all, and that's free agent stuff that was going to come 10 years later. And I think that he recognized, I mean, none of them, Lee May didn't want to go either. None of the black players wanted to go. They had no choice. You had to go, you had to make the best of it. And where it really, where it really <coughs> broke down for him was a, a secret meeting that he'd had with Whitney Young, who pretty much told him, listen, we're going to make this right for you. And come down here, give us a chance. Give the black leaders down here a chance. And we're going to make this right. Atlanta is not going to be Selma. It's not going to be Birmingham. It's not going to be Mobile. And, and Andrew Young was so good on this subject where he kept talking about how you had to get the business buy-in. And the business community in this town made sure that they made it right. And I think that is one of the more underreported parts of the story that um, that really did help kind of change things. And also, I mean, President Carter was great about this as well when he talked about this new wave of of, of progressive politicians who knew that you couldn't keep going the way it was going. And you had to have some sort of public face to prove that you were different. And that public face was a ball team. And first it was the Braves, and then later that year it was the Falcons, and then the next year it was the Hawks, and then before you know it, the, the, the sport is what kind of gives you that world-class feeling. I mean, if you're gonna be a world-class city, you gotta have a sports team, you gotta have first run movies, you've got to have an opera and all of those different things. And sports was really the thing that legitimized this region. Well, it was a tremendous relationship and, and I had one of the more heartbreaking conversations. It was a, it was a great interview, but it was heartbreaking when I was talking to, to, to Tommy's widow, Carolyn, who's still in Mobile, and she was telling me the stories about, about Tommy's last days when he had leukemia and it was clear that he was close to death and how much it just destroyed Henry and how close they were and how I mean, Henry Aaron was very close to creating a, a dynasty, um, a black dynasty in the front office. His brother, Tommy, had a really close, oppor a good opportunity to be, a, to be one of the first manager, black managers in the league. His brother-in-law, his former brother-in-law, Bill Lucas, was the first GM. He was a farm director, so you saw that he was, wasn't just giving lip service to the Robinson mission, but he was actually living it. And, um, and a lot of light went out of the sky when Tommy passed away. I, I think he is, and I was, I got out of the restaurant last night and I was just so, I was so pleased to have been invited to have dinner with him because he was a little kid. I mean, he was happy, and, uh, and I'm looking at him and you're, you realize that, that maybe this gap between Hank and Henry is simply the fact that he's shy. He's not a big public guy. I mean, it was amazing to me watching him um, in the restaurant. We were at uh, Serpa's last night. And he was sitting at the bar by himself. I'm like, that's Hank Aaron. And nobody said a word to him. And, and that wouldn't happen anywhere. And then, of course, Alan had told me that, um, well, one of the reasons he likes to go in there is because everybody else is 30 years old. They don't know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> this so, was, thank you very I much. Have, I have just mm -hmm. really enjoyed the, the stories. We have an opportunity. Howard's going to be signing copies of his book in the lobby, so um, we'll do that in just a second. But please join me in thanking Howard Bryant one more time. <laughs>